Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Civil War Museum's latest installment of our Lunchbox Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Doug Dahman. I'm the Curator of Education here at the Museum in Kenosha. And I just want to remind everyone to uh, tune into this platform in the next couple of weeks. We're going to be featuring talks on the Vicksburg and Gettysburg campaigns. Uh, next week, Tom Marliskis is going to be here joining us on the 29th Wisconsin uh, in their uh, battles during the, the Vicksburg campaign. And then the following week on July 10th, Mr. Steve Acker will be providing us with a driving tour of the Gettysburg battlefield. So make sure to tune in uh, via our Facebook page, our Facebook platform for those two programs. And uh, of course, look at the Civil War Museum's website for more information on times and um, broadcast for those. So thank you so much for your continued support as we've moved to this virtual online platform. Uh, today's program, we have Dan Nettishine here, and Dan's program is entitled The Vicksburg Campaign Grant's Masterpiece. Now we're so glad to have Dan uh, join us again today. Dan was an instructor of military history and the Civil War at the United States Military Academy in West Point, New York. He is a member of the Milwaukee Civil War Roundtable in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and just a longtime friend and supporter of our museum here. He's done numerous classes and programs for us, and I can't wait to hear what he has to say about General Grant and his Vicksburg campaign today. So without further ado, everyone, Dan Nadeshek. Thank you, Doug. It's just a pleasure and an honor to be back here at the uh, Civil War Museum. And it's under, as you point out, uh, very unusual conditions. This is the first time I have spoken down here without an actual audience. And uh, getting back to my West Point time, the thing that I enjoy here at the museum is talking to a group that not only is extremely knowledgeable in the Civil War and the main characters, but also is very enthusiastic. And I would cite one of my examples when I was at uh, West Point I had the privilege of the administration approving my request to actually teach some of my Civil War classes on the Eastern battlefields. And they would allow me to pack up the car and a couple of the cadets would bring theirs and we would go out. And at Gettysburg, just to show again the way the Civil War I think is a quite unique experience in our nation's history, we would study the battle and I'd always culminate the two days uh, presentations out there by lining the entire class up on Seminary Ridge and then we would follow the general route of General Pickett's division moving on the third day and as we crossed the Emmitsburg Road and were negotiating the fences I could look up and down the line of the cadets and I could see emotion on every face and without exception I could tell who the southerners were because there were tears streaming down their cheeks. This was such an emotional experience. And one of the things uh, today that's especially personal and emotional for me is the Vicksburg campaign is the one campaign in the Civil War. I had three great-great-grandfathers who fought in Wisconsin regiments for the war, but this is the one campaign where one of the regiments, the 20th Wisconsin, and my great-great-grandfather, Peter Nettesheim, served under Grant and uh, fought during the campaign. So it's very, very special. So why do I consider the Vicksburg campaign Grant's masterpiece? Well, there are a number of reasons. I believe, to begin with, the maneuver phase, which is where we're going to spend the majority of our time, is perhaps the most dynamic and most decisive two-week maneuver period in the history of the Civil War. Grant had no overwhelming forces, as a matter of fact, and we'll get into it a little more specifically later, he was actually outnumbered during this phase of the campaign. It's in sharp contrast to the blunt force that he used in the 1864 campaigns in Northern Virginia getting down to Richmond, and it's one of those things that uh, often is overlooked by historians who want to characterize Grant in a certain light. 
Another reason this may be considered his masterpiece is this campaign, unlike the vast majority of the Civil War campaigns, is studied worldwide at military academies around the world, and it's one that's most cited by our generals, uh, two of them specifically in the uh, Gulf War and the fighting in the Mideast. And perhaps most importantly, I think from a standpoint of military historians it is. If there's one thing unique about uh, studying the military history of the Civil War, it's the fact that the war came after the Napoleonic period. And many of the military historians look at the Civil War and cite it, uh, von Moltke's probably the worst, that it was just armed mobs moving around because unlike Napoleon, there were always decisive battles where Napoleon would figure out a way not only to, to defeat, but to destroy the enemy army. And I would contend this campaign, the Vicksburg campaign, is merely the second in a series of three campaigns that Grant did exactly the same way. Now, it wasn't dramatic out on the battlefield like a couple of Napoleon's campaigns, but look at Fort Donelson, look at, at uh, Vicksburg, and look at the end of the Richmond Appomattox campaign. In all three cases, Grant selected geographic locations that were so critical to the enemy defense and almost the enemy survival at one point that they were willing to risk the defending army and Grant obliged them, engaged them, and captured the entire army three times. So how are we going to analyze this campaign? I think this is an excellent example of superior generalship. And in this case, it's Ulysses S. Grant's superior generalship. And I'll do it by comparing and contrasting General Grant with General Pemberton, his opponent, and several of the other key players as well. We look at, uh, again, different models that you can use to compare the ability of generalship, and I think when we do one such model that I've frequently used is the principles of war. This is the American version, and if you look up and do some research, there are a variety of different models. Uh, there are probably half a dozen national models that are plus or minus some of these same principles. Uh, they're pretty straightforward, and it's interesting because Doug and I have had conversations on these in the past, and uh, he pointed out, and rightly so, you could apply this not only to the military, but you could also apply this to business or many civilian endeavors where you're going out and trying to take resources and accomplish something. And so as we go down it and we look at these various principles, we'll evaluate General Grant in this specific Vicksburg campaign along with General Pemberton and his immediate boss, uh, General Johnson, and see how it stands up. Uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, we'll get into the precise definitions, too, as we take these one at a time and then look at them within the context of the Vicksburg campaign. So let's start by setting the groundwork for this maneuver phase that's going to be kind of the culmination and lead to uh, ultimately the siege and the capture of Vicksburg and the army. And we do so by looking at a map of the Mississippi River and there are a variety, and I'm not gonna go into detail, you could take the entire time by going into detail here, but from the period November 1862 until the end of March 1863, a period of about five months, General Grant has seven major efforts, and the efforts are basically aimed at getting at Vicksburg, and almost more specifically, getting onto the same side of the river, i.e. the east side of the Mississippi River, so that he can engage the enemy in some type of a major confrontation. He starts by coming down and going overland. And that's right here. He's based in Memphis and is going to come right down the railroad 
and come in behind Vicksburg down into the Jackson, Mississippi area and then cut off Vicksburg. And he starts relatively successfully in November 1862. But what happens very quickly is, and again, for us Wisconsinites, it's a little embarrassing because his main depot, his forward depot, was at Holly Springs, and it was guarded by the 8th Wisconsin, the old Abe Regiment. Well, Cavalry General Earl Van Doren of the Confederacy got in, and without the 8th Wisconsin putting up much of an effort, basically captured the entire site and destroyed Grant's supply base. Grant had no uh, alternative except to turn around at that point and move back up the railroad. He did learn something though in this experience and that was that he could live off the land, that there were resources and supplies available for his army while he licked his wounds and he got back. After that, of course, uh, at that point uh, General Sherman had moved down the Mississippi River about the same time and now with Grant cut off Pemberton was able to confront Sherman at the Chickasaw Bluffs and thwart the second attempt to get at Vicksburg with a very bloody repulse uh, at the Bluffs. Following that, there's a period over the next three or four months of five different efforts to either construct campaigns to bypass Vicksburg or to move in a way that uh, they can get again to the high ground on the east side of the river but north of the city either by short routes or long secu securitous uh, ways to try to get at that point and yet they are unsuccessful. Certainly part of the credit should go to General Pemberton because he is reacting to it but I would say for the most part <clears throat> what you're really faced with is a terrain and a geography problem that just can't be overcome to get through the bayous, to get an effective fighting force there that's properly supported and logistically supplied. So what happens by the end of March is we have General Grant who's now had seven failures and this is I think probably the most important point in the American Civil War, and I say that for a couple of reasons. Number one, Grant's been a failure up to this point with these attempts. General Halleck, his immediate boss, commanding general in Washington, along with Abraham Lincoln, are under tremendous pressure to replace Grant and put in somebody who can succeed here at Vicksburg. Grant himself, I think, realizes it. He's made efforts. In his memoirs, he'll point out that this does keep the men busy during this period, which it does, and it keeps, to some extent, northern newspapers occupied covering the events, which it also does. But I think, truly, Grant had not approved any one of these endeavors without a sincere belief that there was a possibility that they would succeed, that he could get to the dry ground on the east side of the river, and yet Failure, failure, failure. So now we're at the point, and the reason I think this is so important, not just in this campaign, but a moment in the Civil War is going forward, Grant realizes he's got one more shot. He can put everything in it, but this is going to be it. And either he's going to fail, in which case he will be replaced, relegated to some backwater campaign and some area if he isn't cashiered out completely and disappear from the American Civil War. How might the war have been different if that had happened? If he'd have failed just one more time on his eighth shot versus what actually happens? Well, Grant doesn't back down. On the contrary, he comes up with a plan and pretty much it's devised on his own. The way Grant operates is he asks his subordinates for ideas, but it's not a debate, it's not a vote. He does not believe in councils of war. And he feels that he's got to take a high risk but high reward avenue of approach here. And what he decides is he is going to, sometime in the middle of April, run the gauntlet past the guns of Vicksburg down the Mississippi River, get his gunboats and transports down there, and he thinks they will survive that passage going down uh, 
past the uh, Vicksburg to the south. Then once he's down there, he plans to cross the river and finally be on the same side of the river as the Confederates. Now, whether he can logistically support himself is another whole question. But this is going to be the plan, and it's one of these gambles. I think very seldom do you get uh, such a straight contrast or dichotomy. It's one or the other, period. There's no gray here. He's either going to succeed or he's going to fail. And so now let's go and we'll go through, I think, some of the principles of war because there's an excellent teaching in each of these principles, and I think it's grant superiority in this campaign in these principles that makes all the difference. Hmm. Seems to be stuck here, I'm not sure, maybe Doug will, there we go. Thank you. Henry Halleck, so the first one is unity of command. And here's where Grant is so superior to Pemberton that almost anybody reading at any level would be able to see this analyzing the campaign. Unity of command is unity of effort under a single commander. And Grant first starts with the federal command structure above him. Here's his boss, Henry Halleck, and most of you are familiar with Henry Halleck. He used to be the commander in the West, and there he was Grant's immediate boss. And boy, Grant's success at Fort Donaldson, Fort Henry, and Shiloh, and then ultimately the capture of Corinth, gave Halleck the ammunition he needed to become the commander-in-chief and move to Washington, D.C. But Halleck, when he was out west, had Grant in the doghouse as much as he had him on the campaign trail winning battles. Halleck, for example, after, Fort, after Grant's Fort Donaldson success, had him under virtual arrest, basically kept him back at Fort Henry while the army went forward down the Tennessee River because Grant had gone to uh, Nashville and Halleck felt he hadn't been advised properly Grant was a little late on some of his reports. Once in a while, the admin is a loose area, Grant, as he focuses much more on the campaign portion. Following the Battle of Shiloh, which was almost a disaster for the North, Grant came back on the second day and was able to win it, hold the field, and drive the rebels off. But Grant was again relieved of command in a very unique way by Henry Halleck. Halleck relieved him of command by making him his second in command. It's like making him vice president. What does the vice president do? Nothing. And so Grant basically had that position, but George Thomas was given the Army of the Tennessee, Grant's old command. Now Halleck's in Washington, but things change dramatically. All of a sudden, Grant and Halleck have a federal campaign structure and a communications that's rock solid. Halleck's looking for somebody he can trust out west, and it's Grant. No matter what's going on, Halleck and Grant are on the same line. Yeah, there's some opposition, but basically this solidifies Grant. Also with Halleck a thousand miles away, the paperwork isn't quite as important and all these little admin things that Grant kind of skips over to move forward on the campaigns and battlefields aren't quite as important. The other thing that Halleck does in this campaign structure is he's Grant's link to Lincoln. Grant has never met Lincoln, nor Lincoln, of course, Grant, but Henry Halleck in between knows and senses how much Lincoln likes a fighter, Lincoln likes a winner, and that's U.S. Grant. So unity of command at the federal level. Now what about the subordinates? And this becomes very, very interesting. Let's take the first one, the senior man, John McLaren. McLaren's been with Grant since the beginning. He was at Belmont, at Fort Donaldson, at Shiloh. He was his division commander in all of those. And in the interim, 
what he did was he slipped away to Washington. He's a political general, but he's adequate on the battlefields. He's command his division in a fairly straightforward way. Nothing dynamic, but he's good. And Grant's going to use that. What does McLaren do? He's an Illinois congressman who went and met with uh, Lincoln, got Lincoln's promise that if he would go back to Illinois and recruit Illinois soldiers, the biggest troop source for the Western armies, that he, McLaren, could take an expedition down the Mississippi River and try to capture Vicksburg. Aha, McLaren thinks he's successfully gotten behind Grant's back. Only the caveat in the agreement, again, it's Halleck. And Halleck, when he writes up the orders and has them set, allows McLaren to command the expedition, but as long as it's in Grant's theater, which Vicksburg and the Mississippi are, if Grant is physically present, McLaren will be subordinate to Grant. And of course, McLaren bristles at this initially. Grant confronts him, but does so in a way that he doesn't uh, take McLaren's current authority, which is as one of his three corps commanders away, and he deals with him successfully for a while. William Tecumseh Sherman, the next corps commander under Grant. These two have been very closely tied together, primarily through failure. Beginning of the war, Sherman fought at the Battle of First Bull Run, and then he went over, out and took over a major portion of the uh, Western theater. He basically had a nervous breakdown and had to leave and was absent for a couple of months while he got himself back together. Grant, meanwhile, was working up through the ranks, got his brigade, got his division, got his little army, and Sherman came in under Grant. There were a couple of times that we talked about here when uh, Grant was in uh, Halleck's doghouse that uh, he, Grant, was somewhat despondent. And even after Shiloh gave consideration to either resigning or requesting to be removed completely from the command. And it was Sherman who got together with him and talked to him. So they're very close-knit. Now, the other thing that's good about Sherman is he's very good at evaluating strategic initiatives and giving his honest feedback. What about this new plan we just discussed, the grants, go down, run the gauntlet, cross over uh, the Mississippi River, and then attack uh, Vicksburg? What does Sherman think about it? He thinks it absolutely stinks. He cannot think of a worse way to use your final chance or opportunity. He said it certainly violates any kind of idea of concentration. It can't be supported logistically. The only thing to do, in Sherman's opinion, is go back to Memphis and start all over again. Go overland. Now, how does he give Grant the advice? He doesn't embarrass him at any kind of a meeting. He doesn't tell anyone else. He tells Grant personally. But the bottom line, he says, is you make the decision, sir. And whatever decision you make, I support. We're going to see that again as we go through the rest of the campaign. Here's the kid on the block, 1853 graduate, James Birdseye McPherson. He was actually put on Grant's staff real early in the war by Halleck as a, a type of spy. He's a superior engineer officer, number one man in his class at West Point, but Grant saw a lot more potential in him, made him a division commander, and now this is his first campaign where he is a corps commander. So those are his three corps, and Grant has a solid relation. He has built a very superior team. And there's one more member of the team that's got to be mentioned here in this campaign, and that's David Dixon Porter. Porter is the commander of the naval forces in the Vicksburg area. Very interesting command structure here, because unlike Today, where when you have joint operations, you have a clear designated commander. And so the way Grant achieves unity of command here is he befriends Porter 
and they work together very closely, which is really unusual because if there's one thing Porter hates, it's West Pointers. He thinks they're arrogant. He thinks they're too bookish. And yet in Grant, he sees just the opposite mold. What does Porter think of the plan? Porter agrees with Sherman. He thinks this plan doesn't really have a chance, but he said, even though you can't order me because this is not a joint operation, we're, uh, we're equals, it's a joint operation, but an agreement has to be reached here. Porter said, if you decide that's the way we're going to go, I support you fully. And we're going to see again that he does. But what a great, great team. Grant's decision-making method, we talked a little bit about it. Uh, he consults all of these members of his team, but he's going to make and stand by his decision. He does announce one aspect of it that's got everybody kind of curious. He's going to lead with McLaren's Corps. And, of course, Sherman, again, privately tells Grant, big mistake, this guy is not anywhere near as strong as some of your other generals both the senior and subordinates, McPherson feels the same way. But Grant reasonably feels, number one, that's his biggest core. Number two, McLaren is the only one of the, this four-man team who believes in the plan. So there's something going here that maybe McLaren's got a little bit extra motivation because he's seeing this thing as a potential success right from the outset. He doesn't have to be told. And... Probably a very big part is his division is also located in a position where it's very important for the south. And rather than try to bypass through a lot of the muddy, almost non-existent roads, it makes no sense in Grant's opinion. And he can work with McLaren, and he'll watch McLaren as he goes. But again, moral courage uh, really is something important here for Grant and maintaining this unity of command. There's a couple of good quotes also from Grant that I think really reinforces what's going on, especially in terms of unity of command. And here's the first one. It's on decisiveness. This is Grant, quote, anything is better than indecision. We must decide. If I'm wrong, we'll go back and find out and we can do the other thing. But to not decide wastes both time and money and may ruin everything. And then the other aspect of unity of command is his really famous quote, quote, two commanders on the same field are always one too many, unquote. So again, no doubt who's in command and he has built a team. Okay, let's go to the other side of the field. And we have John Pemberton. And Pemberton is a West Point graduate. He's a classmate, a West Point classmate of Braxton Bragg, who's commanding the other army out in the West, as well as Joe Hooker, who is commanding the army in the Pennsylvania area and, unbeknownst to him, is about to be relieved and replaced by General George Gordon Meade. So the class of... West Point class of 1837 is pretty instrumental here in these uh, summer of 1863 campaigns. What about the command structure of the Confederacy? How does that compare to what we've just described for the North? The immediate commander in the West is Joseph E. Johnston. He came out because Davis felt very strongly, Jefferson Davis, that the West needed an overall commander because they had basically two theaters going. They had the one in the Mississippi River Vicksburg area, and they had the one in the Chattanooga, Tennessee area. And so he went out and took command. The first question Jefferson Davis was asked by Joe Johnson when he reported for his command is, Sir, what's your priority? Which is more important? Vicksburg or Chattanooga? Davis's reply, quote unquote, both. Talk about unity of command and being able to put together your priorities and decide. And furthermore, Davis said, 
and now we're talking in the February-March time frame, things are going so well at Vicksburg, General Johnson, I don't want you to go anywhere near the Mississippi River. I want you to stay in Tennessee until further notice. We think that that's the area that we need some shoring up and we'll need your command influence there. So again, think again in terms of unity of command and getting a unity of effort going here. It is not until April 30th to May 1st, once Grant crosses the river, that finally Davis says to Johnson, I think you better go to Vicksburg to start finding out exactly what's going on and in the meantime, get as many reinforcements as you can into that area. So again, it's an effort that is unfortunately almost being undermined by the Confederate hierarchy and command. The other problem with the structure and Joe, Joe Johnson is so frustrated is that almost every subordinate Confederate commander he has, and I'm not just talking Bragg and Pemberton, I'm talking some of their subordinates, have hotlines to Richmond and Davis. They can talk directly to Davis. They can talk to his cabinet members. They can talk to the Secretary of War. Well, it's such an undermining influence. It's all often being set up then Davis versus Johnson rather than Davis serving under Johnson. And probably the final point in the hierarchy here that's a problem with unity of command is the Trans-Mississippi area. Unlike Grant, who has total command of Trans-Mississippi and can move troops back and forth as he wants, the same as he can of his own army. In the Confederate hierarchy, Johnson has absolutely no authority over the Trans-Mississippi area. So, let's go to the subordinates of General Pemberton. First one here is Carter Stevenson. Stevenson overlapped with uh, uh, Pemberton for three years at West Point, so they know each other uh, fairly well. He is not dynamic. He was transferred from Bragg's army, and so he came in and took over his division command, and he is headquartered at Vicksburg. And the reason he is headquartered at Vicksburg is Pemberton decides he can better handle the defense of the entire area if he, Pemberton, maintains his headquarters at Jackson, Mississippi, about 50 to 60 miles east of Vicksburg, which again, think in terms of the uh, unity of command issue. Second division commander he has is William Loring. This guy is something else. He is the senior division commander and he is troublesome. He served the first year of the war in the Eastern Theater and he was constantly getting into confrontations with his bosses. Uh, Loring's probably problem was he was the senior, or he was the youngest colonel in the pre-war army, and so he was above a lot of the others, including Pemberton, and once the war broke out and he joined the Confederacy, he automatically thought anybody he ranked in the old uh, army, he ought to rank now, and it was almost the opposite. In the East, he got into fight after fight. Finally, he met his match, Stonewall Jackson. The two of them went at it, and it got so bad, Jackson said, I not only want him out of my command and out of this army, I want him out of the theater. And with that, he was transferred to the Western Theater. He carries on about the same way, and a lot of times Pemberton is very frustrated because it's almost like Loring's going to decide on the decision before he's going to go ahead and follow orders. The third member, the junior man, and he is a classmate, a West Point classmate, class of 53, of McPherson. He's good, John Bowen. He brought the Missouri militia into the Army long before, fought with distinction at Shiloh, was badly wounded, and he is here, and he's very active in his current role. He has the southern part, the area where Grant is getting ready to cross, and so there is a 
true combat commander here. The problem with it is he has the smallest division. The way the troops are deployed throughout the Mississippi area between Jackson and Vicksburg is such that even reinforcements aren't readily available for Bowen. At the same time, Pemberton keeps his headquarters at Jackson. 16th of April, Porter successfully runs the batteries at Vicksburg with his gunboats and many of his transports. They lose one ship, but the rest get through. And Pemberton remains. Grant crosses the river on the 30th of April, 1st of May. Pemberton finally makes the decision to move his headquarters from Jackson back to Vicksburg to take command of the situation there. So again, the whole idea of the unity of command is really a problem. The other issue I think that comes up here is trying to decide now within the theater, what is more important, the fortress at Vicksburg or the survival of the army? And that question is asked. And poor Pemberton has a situation where Johnson says, clearly, it's the survival of the army. And while he says this to Pemberton, in his hand, Pemberton has a telegraph from Richmond, Jefferson Davis, saying, save Vicksburg at any cost. No cost is too great. And so in his mind, again, He's sliced and diced, and he is going to protect Vicksburg, obviously, because it's the president. So again, we can see unity of command. It's just a night and day difference between the two armies and the structures above the armies, the federal versus the Confederate command. The next key, I would say, uh, principle of war that we're going to look at is objective. Objective is very simple. It's set a goal that is decisive, clearly attained by the re uh, clearly defined, and attainable by the resources you have. So it has three aspects. And again, Grant is very superior in selecting this, although it's almost pre-selected for him and that is the capture of Vicksburg. But as this campaign unfolds, more and more Grant is looking at it as a potential, as he had done at Donaldson, of possibly destroying the entire Confederate Army that is defending it. Meanwhile, Pemberton has a problem. Pemberton's problem, and it probably leads directly from the lack of unity of command, is there's no clarification as far as defense of Vicksburg versus survival of the army. Even though he sees Davis clearly as being the highest ranking, so survival of Vicksburg is key, as he gets the messages now that Johnson has been moved into the Vicksburg area and he's bringing reinforcements, he gets a number of orders from Johnson to move away from Vicksburg. Johnson says, look, you can defend Vicksburg by fighting a mobile defense. You can evacuate the city, combine with me and with our overwhelming force, we'll destroy Grant, and then we have defended Vicksburg properly. You don't have to sit in the entrenchments. Well, Pemberton thinks about that, but he's going to try to do both, and in fact, he'll do neither. Uh, he will not completely abandon the fortifications there anytime there seems to be a threat toward it. That's where he goes. Next element of the principles is surprise. Achieve an unexpected advantage over your enemy. Here again, this campaign grant, it's almost like he's got the ideal situation and he's got the ideal enemy commander to buy in. First, he's got Colonel Benjamin Grierson who is actually east of Jackson and starts a cavalry raid moving down on the railroads 
east of Jackson, Mississippi. In other words, he's going to cut the lines of communication. And this kicks off mid-April. Pemberton, who's still out there at that point in time, basically starts to react to Grierson's raid. He draws all his cavalry out into the area and makes a concerted effort to intercept him, to protect the railroads. He even draws some of the infantry out there. And there's the unknown. If cavalry is moving down this area, is there the potential that there's more behind it, uh, a much stronger force? So extremely successful in terms of the surprise and disrupting the enemy. Uh, the second area is Porter running the gauntlet. This also comes as a total shock to the Confederates. They were having a huge military ball, as a matter of fact, the night, just by coincidence of selection, had to leave the ball to go out to try to intercept the running of the gauntlet. Uh, did cause some damage, but didn't stop it. But again, total surprise. The third major surprise that uh, Grant picks is after Sherman's explained how much he's opposed to this plan, Grant said, fine, because you're going to play an instrumental part. And the first thing I want you to do is, while we're crossing down south, I want you to move forward up to, and this one we can see on the map, Haynes Bluff. Up in this area, here's Vicksburg. Grant's going to cross down here and at... Uh, <clears throat> Bruinsburg, and meanwhile, Sherman is so effective in moving his corps up to, to uh, Haynes Bluff, he deploys 10 regiments, and the Confederate Stevenson, who was in Vicksburg, takes his entire division up to the area. Not only that, but when the 10 regiments deploy and begin a major demonstration, he thinks is a frontal assault vanguard for a much larger force, he contacts Pemberton and says the main attack is in his front, not down south where they have run the gauntlet and are even beginning at this point to look like they might cross the river. And so not only does it surprise and it's a feint, but it draws even more forces with the thought that because of the rigorous manner in which Sherman executed it, this might be the main attack, not coming in the south. And so... What happens, again, is just a major surprise. The flip side, of course, in analyzing is the security. Poor Pemberton, again, is really having problems. And as we've mentioned, he draws off his cavalry with the Grierson raid. He reinforces the garrison to try to make sure that Vicksburg is secured. When Stevenson bites on Sherman's fate, He's again confused and doesn't know where the main attack is coming. And he will again maintain his headquarters until Grant actually crosses on the 1st of May. And it comes with the biggest and probably most important then culmination factor, and that's offense. Seize, retain, and exploit the initiative. And this is just what Grant does. Grant is extremely big and no matter what you see about Grant in the Civil War on the virtue of time, always use time as your friend, whether it's delaying or whether it's exploiting. And this one is one of those exploitation. The initial plan that Halleck had laid out is if Grant is successful in crossing, Halleck wasn't sure he would be, but he does successfully cross, then in Halleck's belief, Grant should wait. He should wait until Banks comes up from the south with his army, combine the two. Grant said, fine, let's take a look at this. He contacts Banks, finds out Banks really can't have his entire army up and supported for almost another 30 days. Well, here we've gone through all these measures to take advantage of time and have a huge advantage vis-a-vis -vis Pemberton. We're not about to give it away. And so... Grant decides he's going to have to make the move. He's going to have to continue and use the other two aspects of the principles of war. Maneuver, i.e. placing your combat power in a position of advantage. And then most importantly,
And then most importantly, mass. Mass so that you have overwhelming combat power at the decisive time and point. And what Grant does is he sets up a series of times and points. And we'll go through them right here to begin with. He was going to cross at Grand Gulf. Porter is asked to eliminate the Grand Gulf batteries, and he can't do it. Bowen's just too strong there with his fortifications. So Grant, through his intelligence, finds an escaped slave who knows the territory very well, and he said, well, General, why don't you just cross 10 miles further south? It's totally unopposed. I didn't see a Confederate soldier in the entire area. And so the change is to Bruinsburg. And within a matter of a day, Grant crosses. And this is going to be the largest amphibious crossing by the United States Army in time of war until June 6, 1944, D-Day. He crosses almost 25,000 soldiers and is not satisfied. He moves immediately and gives battle to Bowen at Port Gibson. And again, through his maneuver, he's achieved such overwhelming mass. Here at uh, Port Hudson, Grant outnumbers Bowen 24,000 to 7,000, one day after crossing the river. And Bowen knows exactly what's going on, but he's so frustrated because Pemberton is, has so diversified the locations of his various units that they are all over and there are none within supporting distance. What Grant does next, within a day or two, is he moves up and he takes Grand Gulf from the rear. He couldn't get it from the front, but from the rear because it's south of the Big Black River, he could just march into town. Bowen isn't stupid enough to stay there because there's no fortifications defending it. Bowen has to pull out, and so Grant, in a matter of about seven days, builds up his base, brings his reinforcements, has Sherman come down and cross the river. And so now, on the 8th of June, even though he's outnumbered in the theater by 10 to 15,000 men, if you combine Bragg, uh, you combine Pemberton, with Johnson's force, Grant is ready to roll. And the way he does it is he sets sights. His thought is he can come up south of the Big Black River, the logical place where many are expecting, including Sherman. Sherman still thinks it's a good idea to not abandon a logistical base that he's starting to build at Grand Gulf, but to come up from the south. Well, that's where the defenses are. The other thing that Grant has is intelligence that Johnson is moving in from the Tennessee area with some reinforcements. And so Grant sets out again, maneuver and mass on three parallel roads. He has his three corps moving simultaneously without a line of communication. He learned that at Holly Springs. He loads up anything that has wheels on it. He comes up with 150 to 200 wheeled vehicles, which he loads primarily with ammunition. He said, we've got four or five days of rations we can carry. If it takes longer, we go on lower rations and we eat off the land. Turns out he's absolutely right. So he covers the 30 or 40 miles heading for Raymond because he now has decided the best way to Vicksburg is not directly to Vicksburg. It's out east, take up a central position, take advantage of the situation he has. As he moves to Raymond, which he arrives on the 12th with Sherman and McPherson's corps. Again, he has overwhelming mass at the decisive time and point. He outnumbers Gregg's brigade 10,000 to 3,000 with the first elements that reach the field. And within a matter of hours, he has again successfully taken his next big step. Following that, turns right around and gives both McPherson and Sherman orders that they move on Jackson, which is where the first 5,000 men of Johnson's vanguard have come in. 
very decisively, they take the city and basically destroy it as a communication center to bring in anything further from the west, uh, from the east to support Vicksburg. And rather than sit here, when he sees Johnson move, Johnson only has the 5,000. He's got another 5,000 within a couple days march, but it's going to be too late. Johnson just pulls off to the north and, again, orders Pemberton to make a move to combine with him so they can fight Grant together. Too late. Here he comes now back. Now instead of moving east, he's moving west, right down the railroad line that had supplied Vicksburg. And as he does, he is meeting at Champion Hill, and probably the major battle of the entire campaign is fought there. Uh, I think Grant has almost 30,000 men on the field, almost his entire army at this point. Uh, Pemberton is able to move about 20,000, and again, he's getting static from Loring, uh, who is very slow coming up, and it ends up in the long run of being uh, a deciding factor. Another problem with this is as he was moving to contact Pemberton, and again, back to the generalship theme, he thought that he should join with Johnson and then pitch into Grant near the Jackson area. At a council of war that was almost more of a let's vote on this, Loring wins the day because Loring says, no, no, the way to do this is when you're up here at Edwards Station moving toward him, you send two of your divisions down near Raymond to cut his line of communication, and that'll force Grant back. Well, Grant has no line of communication, so again, wasted time, wasted effort. Champion Hill, another smashing success. One more stop on the way to Vicksburg, and that's the uh, Big Black River Bridge. Pemberton probably waits too long here and loses more casualties because Loring was so slow in his movement coming out of the uh, uh, Battle of Champion Hill that he gets cut off. And Loring tries to rejoin the Confederates. He can't. He, Loring has to go back to Jackson and then north and find Johnson, so basically not only all the casualties that were lost, but on top of it, unfortunately, uh, Loring's entire division is lost to Pemberton. And so in a magnificent campaign of maneuver, Grant is now in position to conduct a siege, which in a 47-day period on the 4th of July, the day after Gettysburg, will result in Pemberton's surrender. Grant coming immediately out of this success is almost overly confident in that he orders two attacks on the 19th of May and the 22nd of the fortifications around Vicksburg and suffers heavy repulses. That's probably a class in itself. But again, Grant rolled the dice. Maybe the entire outcome of the Civil War relied on this two-week period. Grant was willing to take the big risk for the big reward and was highly, highly successful. Lincoln's response, the father of waters flows unvexed to the sea. Thank you.